I think we should start. I think it would probably be more amiable if maybe people uh, moved up so that we don't have to see quite so many lamentably empty seats. Indeed, before I introduce the speaker, I would just like, if only for the sake of getting it off my chest, uh, address, as it were, in a literary form, all those people who are not here. Fuck you. Um, we're going to have to think about this, like, seriously. It is completely intolerable at the AA for people to kind of put together evening lectures on a wide range of topics and that somehow the narrowness, the increasing narrowness of our kind of students' concerns means that they don't kind of come. Um, don't come in this case, you know, to see an absolutely crucial, the work of a con crucial contemporary uh, artist. I would have thought when I saw that we were going to have a talk on Mike Kelly that we would indeed have that problem we used to have ten years ago of having to kind of push the back door shut and say that for health and safety reasons we can't accommodate quite so many people in the hall. Uh, and this really is pathetic. Anyway, having said that, let's put all those other people out of our minds um, and welcome the speaker, John Welshman, who's going to talk about, um, in particular, Mike Kelly's extracurricular, the, the, the work extracurricular activities. John Welshman uh, is uh, an, an art historian who moved from London to the States, and he's going to produce two works by the artist Mike Kelly, The Day is Done, and Extracurricular Activity Projective Reconstruction. It's described as a musical come vaudeville video review, and they explore the relation between memory, repression, architectural, and institutional space. John Wilson is Professor of Art History in the Visual Arts Department uh, in uh, the School at the University of California, San Diego, and is also Chair of the Southern California of Art Schools. His books include Art After Appropriation, Essays on Art in the 1990s. He's also co-author of Mike Kelly, published by Feiden. Um, that's the one with, is that the one with, with Tony Vidler as well? Yes. And the essay by Bataille. Um, and then editor of Rethinking Borders, Minnesota University Press. And he's involved in the kind of huge task of collecting, I think what he says is will be eight volumes in the end, seven of the collected writings uh, of Mike Kelly on art. So small band of brothers we may be, and sisters, but let us welcome John Rothman. Thank you very much. Well, thanks, uh, thanks, Mark, and thank, thank you for coming. It is a big evening. I realize there's a lot of stuff going on with uh, the Freeze Art Fair, and Zoo is opening tonight, and so on and so forth. Can't compete against that. This is a, I, I some, was just trying to think if I could recalibrate what I was going to say tonight to a, um, a more particular and intimate audience than I was expecting. But I think I, I can't because it's, um, it's a very involved talk. So I'm just going to give it anyway the way it was rather than try and chop it up and digest it more amenably. Um, can we go to the, to the PowerPoint? Thanks a lot. <laughs> Here's a head text from Bataille, Georges Bataille, to get us going. Dance and poetry, music and the different arts contribute to making the festival the place 
and time of a spectacular letting loose. Day is Done, which is the generic title of the exhibition that I'm going to talk to you about this evening, takes the form of a rambunctious musical come vaudeville video review chopped into 31 choreographed numbers and distributed across a series of 25 sculptural viewing stations composed of props from each shoot. Laid out in a labyrinthine sequence in the cavernous Gagosian Gallery in New York City last year, the installational islands that focused Kelly's dissident Sonne Lumiere were augmented by a set of standalone sculptures, and we'll see some of those in a minute. The full title of the exhibition, Extracurricular Activity Projective Reconstruction, numbers 2 to 32, makes us aware of its falsely modest place in Keller's extravagant vision of a complete cycle of 365 separate videos, each with its own sculptural setting or accompaniment. The inaugural piece, uh, Extracurricular Activity Projective Reconstruction, which I'm going to abbreviate to EAPR from now on, number one, was a 30-minute 50s-style melodrama that first appeared five years ago at the Emmy Fontana Gallery in Milan and was seen again at the Royal Academy of Arts Apocalypse, Beauty and Horror in Contemporary Art in 2000. Now, the carnivalesque profusion of Day is Done was launched almost perversely by an animating force that turns like a motor in reverse, fueled by a battery running backwards. For the project was founded on the tessellation of blanknesses that form the partial unrecall of Kelly's memory of the educational institutions he attended from kindergarten to CalArts, the California Institute of the Arts in Valencia, from his youth then to university which he assembled a decade ago as an architectural model in this piece that you see on screen, Educational Complex, which dates from 1995. These absent scenes of social formation become the organizing principle for a more generalized regimen of repressed memories, a dream book, if you like, of traumatic episodes transacted in the uber institutional space that frames the exhibition. Kelly has engineered a panorama of repressed episodes precipitated by an iconic assemblage of yearbook photographs representing different types of generic activity, religious, motivational, costume, equestrian, and so on which he willfully recalls into art. He kick-starts the tumult of Day is Done with what amounts to a gigantic evacuation, a kind of demise-en-scene, in which the subject matter is always already available, but at the same time eventuates as pure projection, a paradox caught up at the heart of the testimonial histories of repressed memory syndrome that offer another point of commencement for these diverse projects. Founded thus on absence and retreat, it comes as a further shock to realize that each section of one of the most generically hybrid, episodically layered, and plurally elusive works of recent times is formed from a single focused point of origin. The objects that corral the whirligig of types and situations almost manically unfolded from them are photographs sourced from among the hundreds of categorized images from high school yearbooks that Kelly has hoarded over the years. The history and latter-day reincarnation of the yearbook, along with a proliferation of courses and instructional seminars on its efficient and meaningful production, 
are well documented in the literature on high schools and educational institutions. We learn from one source that the makeup of the yearbook is animated by a wider range of functions that include historical record, memory book, reference source, public relations vehicle, educational tool. The ancestry of the form probably dates back to the early 1700s with the production of books of statistical summaries and accumulated facts, and it evolved into something approaching its modern format as a conjunction of two publishing forms, school newspapers and literary magazines. In the 30s and 40s, the genre matured with the introduction of uh, economical offset lithography. For Kelly, however, the yearbook has blossomed cinematically from these social functions into an archive for the recovery of missing time, traumatic, repressed, abandoned. The series of carefully selected grainy yearbook pictures act like Freudian dream texts, but once more in reverse. Already seemingly supplied with many of the quotients of the dream work described by Freud in the sixth chapter of the interpretation of, the dream, of dreams, that is to say, object displacements, self-revelatory poses, intimations of the grotesque, erratic juxtapositions of bodies and objects, prurient peer dynamics, and so on, they are in themselves precisely not the product of dream or fantasy, but found images snipped from the quotidian world of ritualized postures. Instead of arriving as a consequence of delirious dreaming, personal history, or familial repressions, the unconscious activities that animate the photos are a complexly inaccessible product of the social unconscious of Midwest Americana. Deli uh, Kelly has taken on this image repertoire with a reformulated touch of the terrifying precision attributed to the mutating objects unveiled by Salvador Dali in his theory and practice of critical paranoia. Like his, they are images that feed interpretation back onto their appropriators. Kelly scours the photographs right down to their plentiful grain, amplifying their soundless intimations of camaraderie and alienation, absconding with the smallest details of their iconography, projecting vast networks of group interaction from the implied gestures of static heads and hands. What he offers in these moves is a predictive scoring for the interplay of sounds and conversations as yet unheard, which draw his protagonists out into an imagined world retrofitted by their own system of inferences in a manner that subtly inverts Duchamp's formula for, quote, drawing on chance. The nature of Kelly's creatively dependent defection from his governing images underwrites um, the entire project. It takes place, I want to argue, in many dimensions, beginning with the artist's insistence that day is done is not predicated simply on his own experiences. While the artist may have lived through some of this stuff himself while coming of age in a blue-collar Detroit suburb, he has reached instead for generic and cross-generational experiences and situations. The virtual amphitheater that plays host to Kelly's giant feint of retrievals and embellishments is piled high with local performativities engendered by amateur players whose rescripting of received traditions is tethered to its photographic origin and then wildly overcoded in its reenactment. One outcome of this regressive articulation takes the form of a retort to the negative dialectics of the late modernist tradition in which Kelly was schooled, to the rhetorical lineage of reduction, delimitation, and self-reference 
championed by Greenbergian formalists, to the logic of attenuation, specificity, and perceptual objecthood embraced by the minimalists, to the fables of immateriality spun by conceptual art, Kelly adds a psychological twist distantly related to the constructs of negative entropy and ruins in reverse set out by his fellow postmodern contrarian, Robert Smithson. Kelly advances backwards then to the prior conditions of cultural possibility, baffling the frame-bound object with something transported through the mind before an action or gesture is even made. He fires blankness back at invisibility, cancelling out its absence. And he does all this to grant himself audacious permission for an explosion of color and light, sound and movement, based on the rigmaroles of reconstruction rather than the duties of deconstruction. Now, one of the many issues precipitated by all this is the idea of falsity, as it appears in accounts of false memory syndrome that have long interest Kelly, long interested uh, the artist. When we look at the videoed panorama of dancing goths, as here, um, this is uh, the shy Satanist uh, image, the original yearbook photograph and Kelly's reconstruction, that's the general pairing that you've so far seen. Uh, here, a lonely vampire. Here, um, religious episodes, which are predominant in the 30-odd um, shots that Kelly has chosen. This one is called Choosing a Mary. Um, and we have other religious episodes as well, the supplicating Joseph uh, and the nativity. Um, there are pagan whimsies like the May Maynad and various woodsy wanderings. All these have a kind of capricious presence and vivacious particularity. They come across as very real. For particular viewers in certain circumstances, they might be more appealing uh, or even, in one sense, true. Kelly is exploring art's particular capacity to solicit investment in things that are, in one dimension at least, obviously false. But he crosses this with the idea, as he puts it, that psychically, quote, there's no difference between fiction and memory. They become confused. In my case, he continues, things that I experience through film or literature become completely confused with real experience. So sometimes I don't know whether such a thing happened or didn't happen. This, of course, he concludes, lies at the heart of repressed memory syndrome. Now, in consequence, a slew of misrepresentations streams from the images that are deeply embedded in ritual forms their protagonists enact. Day is done thrives in the space between the found, the plausible, and the fantasized. It throws into question the opposition between something that we might want to call restorative a situation in which the act, artist acts like a detective to engineer the closest possible visual and performative fit with character or type between this and the reconstructive. The exhibition stakes out an intensely fertile middle ground then between these terms and administers in the process a surprising jolt to the category of the artwork. By layering artistic fantasy over the formal remainders of social misunderstanding and blending both with Kelly's characteristic structural clarity, Day is Done invents a new set of creatively unstable relations between objects and projections. Now, one of Kelly's achievements here is a kind of tumultuous obverse and scintillating retort to that round of re-photographic practice that so gripped the art world from the late 70s through the 1980s. 
Both Kelly and Sherry Levine, for example, begin with a photograph. One ultra vernacular, the other, at least in some sense, high or fine. This is Sherry Levine, untitled after Walker Evans, familiar image, I'm sure, to most of you. Um, this is Kelly's farm girl. But while Levine's gestures of singular appropriation thrive almost exclusively on the critical context that underwrites their reception, recycling it through questions of originality, authorship, and the copy which viewers and crit critics further extend, Kelly subjects his found photographs to social and formal extrapolation overcoding them with a giddy combination of faux logical implications and situational projection. Levine, we might say, inters the photograph in the coffin of its authorship. Kelly resurrects its anonymous protagonists into a voracious afterlife of almost apocryphal dimensions. Now, if we consider Kelly's relation to another characteristic, slightly later turn in the art world, that is to say to the black, bo black box environments that house so many contemporary media-based projects and installations, it becomes clear that Kelly occupies the kaleidoscopic end of another art world antithesis. Consider, for example, Doug Aitken's The Moment 90, uh, 2004 to 2005, a serpentine wave of 11 identical mirror-backed plasma screens suspended by black poles hanging from the ceiling. The viewing environment is blacked out, the walls painted black, the floors seamlessly covered with black carpet so that spectators, while left free to take up multiple and partial viewing positions in the gallery space, are really looking from within the dark void of a negative white cube. They are thrown back in this experience on the seriality and sequence of a flickering screen world that couples with the phenomenological experience of self, image, and reflection. <coughs> Kelly disputes with the formats of recent media-based artwork by bringing his multiple projection screens into elaborate relation with sculptures and props so that the performative actions they image spill over associatively into the environments around them, which are in turn relit by an assemblage of lights and flashing signage. In like manner, Kelly's almost endless countdown of riotous time outs plays havoc with the well-mannered serial imagination of the post-minimalist art world. Not only does he lead his total project into another dimension of reach in terms of scale and duration, but Kelly also deploys the limitless horizon of small town vernaculars like Smithson used the Western landscape. While Days Dunn has few parallels in the art world, Kelly's conceptual braid of carnival, mischief, and ludic irony finds some rapport in recent experimental theater, notably a very merry, unauthorized Scientology pageant, 2003, directed by Alex Timbers with text and music by Kyle Jarrow. This deadpan musical biography of the life of L. Ron Hubbard, 1911 to 86, founder of the Church of Scientology and author of about 100 books, including Dianetics, the Modern Science of Mental Health, 1950, crosses, as it were, plastic swords with Kelly's opus on a number of fronts. I'm sorry, these images seem to have um, lost their color, which is a shame. <laughs> Set of relationships 
has, I think, several dimensions. These include the similar use by both of amateur and child actors who perform with affecting ungainliness, according to the um, Scientology pageant script. Um, they share goofy, high-color sets, so high-color that we lost the color. Um, and also a uh, screwball, highfalutin dialogue and a shared commitment to what one critic writing about the Scientology play described as the authentically, quote, home-brewed flavor of the holiday religious pageants that sprout in church basements and school gyms, replete with, quote, quote, perky anthems of uplift and optimism. Both productions indulge in a repertoire of primal metaphors, Kelly's pseudo-pagan mysticism and purple poetics, Timbers and Jarrow's larval imagery of mental renewal. Both pick out their subjects with a combination of biography, memory, and pseudo-cosmology. Both debunk the specter of grandiose religiosity. The very merry unauthorized Scientology pageant, for example, adopts the form of a, quote, jazzed up saint's play. These are Kelly's child angels, but if you could read that image, they would be very similar to the ones in the Scientology pageant. Must be the difference between a TIFF and a JPEG, I think. Day is Done meets out the stories of Mary and Joseph with a nod to the Apocrypha. Uh, both uh, are also founded on metaphors of renewal and enlightenment backed by solar imagery in the Scientology pageant, quote, now the sun will shine, now we'll be just fine, we've got the science of the mind. And both finally share a commitment to what the playwrights term post-ironic theater. We're very interested, they write, in, quote, deconstructing icons and rebuilding them. We want to be both ironic and sincere. But we should not forget that the repressions stained on Kelly's palate are in equal part tame, terrifying, and traumatic, as well as, in another dimension, possibly false. Unlike that spectacularization of trauma and violence, dubbed wound culture, that provided a visceral bookend to the artistic excesses of the 1990s, the traumas fetched up in Day is Done are, for the most part, dressed up in a wardrobe of comforting ritual diversions. Such events may actually represent or enact the repression that produces them as anodyne pastimes, or they may bear witness to traumatic experience that is as yet not apprehended, perhaps not even quite delivered. How can art be made, we might ask, from something as banal, nostalgic, and sentimentalizing as a candle lighting ceremony, one of those moments in the social round that catch us at our most affected or pious, dutiful or generically romantic? Could you play um, the candle lighting video for a second? light to allay your fears, to banish darkness, give it flight. So I spark this wick tonight. Darkness flees, it cannot hide, 
Lighting ceremony, which is one of the most elaborate in the exhibition, though you're only really getting a, a taste of it. That was a first draft, rough cut of something that then was redistributed onto three channels, posed in three different forms of sculptural installation that obviously you can't see. Um, so you're, just, you're really just getting a, a little bit of a, a hint of, of how the dynamic went together. And you can see from the quality of the images that we have here that, it's, that the final version is um, uh, much more interesting. But his um, candlelighting ceremony then um, set out in a triple video installation in which lightings are enacted by Catholic and Jewish girls with a commentary provided by two thugs. The three screens show scenes of a plump, blonde, besmocked girl chanting religious rhymes, her taper in hand and wicks, as you see here, all around, intercut with a couple of toughs, one sporting a Nazi armband, dishing out prejudice to a rap beat, while the pious blonde ends up reciting a mantra petitioning for the conversion of the Jews. In this video of the impromptu, uh, sorry, his video of the impromptu memorials in downtown uh, New York City, 9-11, 2001, Kelly's friend and contemporary Tony Orsler offered another dimension for the socially spontaneous combustions of the candle, its inexorable capacity to focus regressive and sentimentalizing group ritual and seemingly to stand in for, even to annex, the inexpressible. 
For what the candlestick offers, if you like, is a dimly illuminated, quietest reconstitution of the transporting cycle of white light and burning heat that Georges Bataille associates with the heterogeneous expenditures of the carnival, with ritual, with sacrifice, and letting loose. Fervid processes that Kelly reflects back only in the guttering formats of surrogate absence. Other episodes in the event structure of Days Done, such as the boy in the barber's shop from the Devil's Door sequence, restage the traumatic moment itself before sublimating it into song. Arriving after the Devil's bad taste wedding night joke about a bride in pieces, this scene with its allusions to the castration complex, infantile or pregenital sexuality, and coming of age, offers one of the most unfiltered instances of Kelly's use of screen memories to fill in for the traumatic event. While the long soap opera scene, you're seeing an image here, of the singles mixer, for example, measures out the unending serial abuse engendered by the incantation, transference, and self-performance of stereotypes themselves. Instead of representing the ignition of trauma, as at, say, Columbine, Kelly images as yet muted moments of extreme distress, burning slowly up the long fuse of the uncanny, ready at any moment to snuff themselves out with an overdose of recognition or opacity. One effect of the exhibition is surely to provoke the fleeting or fragmented familiarity of the déjà vu, as its viewers are momentarily taken back by, say, candles or fake camaraderie or Christmas to their own uneasy moments of social, ritual or sexual formation and loss. Kelly has long been compelled by the emergence of spaces, partial and imagined, from points of origin that are obstructed by the frictions of memory or the failures of resolution. Most of the physical structures and video locations we encounter in Days Done are the product of massive feats of extrapolation, as we've seen, from the sketchy peripheries that make up the extra figural zones of the yearbook photographs. In fact, the backgrounds of several of these photographs were either indecipherably blank or closed off by stage or space petitioning curtains. That's the case with um, number 13, Thugs, number 14, Modern Dance, number 15, Goth Dance, and number 16, Mimes, as you can see from this uh, illustration. Others are offered locations that were clearly institutional, but otherwise undefined. They might be classrooms, meeting rooms, office common areas, um, and this is the case clearly with number eight, singles mixer, number nine, farm girl, number 10, group portrait. Some backdrops situate the action in larger communal spaces, such as gymnasia, assembly halls, uh, and so on, and some were more textured and identifiable, notably the ritual or congregational settings of number 11, uh, Catholic girl, actually I don't have an illustration for that, and number 12, um, Jewess, or the simulated ecclesiastical space here of number 27, gospel dance with its stage set modernist window. Some, yet, uh, yet further, offered details of props and backdrops from their original performance settings, number 17, heartthrob vampire, number 18, morose, morose ghoul, number 19, the shy satanist, 20, lonely vampire, 21, chicken dance, and the final one of all, which I'll show you at the end, horse dance of the false virgin. Well, uh, finally, a number of photographs image outdoor activities, whether situated adjacent to the entrance or the facade of a building. This is um, number five, sick vampire, 
or um, located in quasi-bucolic environments, um, such as number six, motivational speech, and number seven, the Woods Group. As these spaces thickened into the funfair of ebullient sideshows, the exhibition uh, viewers uh, uh, negotiated um, a defining uh, relation to the series of provisional or supplemental structures they contain, thresholds, foyers, architectural interstices, which had largely defined their first appearance. That's the Woods Group. The, um, the repertoire of these spatial articulations in Days Done ranges from corridors or office connectors, as here replete with um, institutional planters. Um, it includes uh, chain link uh, perimeter fencing, uh, as you see in this image. Um, and this is the fencing that separates the woods group from the grounds of an institution. A detailed view of it there. It includes uninflected interiors featuring in different inst instances um, a, a simple brick fireplace. You saw that in one of the large installation shots. Um, formica tables, just pull out tables of, of this kind. Makeshift partitions, basic podia, simulated wood grain wall panels as here, and uh, a variety of um, motel and homemade uh, signage as this one, welcome to the annual singles mixer. The sum of all this delivers a sequence of transmissive scenes, shifting social conduits or generic nodes that thumb their noses at the rarefied articulations of what we might call the properly architectural. In this condition, ranged against architecture, they constitute another contact zone edged up uh, against the counter-symbolic theorization of Bataille. If the close-up disbursement of yearbook photos is its focal point then, the widest aperture for the fractal array of downtime dissipations that make up day is done is the nature of downtime itself. All that elapses after school or business hours, all the surplus time when one is not at work and thus not governed by the obligations of labor or duty. To understand the location of day is done in the context of the theories and practices of leisure, carnival, and vernacular ritual that proliferated following the publication in 1899 of Thorsten Verblen's uh, The Theory of the Leisure Class, it is important, first of all, to underline the sheer distance that separates its episodic prolixity from the would-be benign positivism and social utilitarianism, which form the immediate background against which Veblen himself contested. Veblen's treatise quickly dismisses the rational conception of leisure as a supplemental temporality that arrives with the completion of labor and is organized by the twin goals of pleasure and happiness. For all its cranky counter-classicist quaintness, Veblen, in fact, kick-starts the pilgrimage of 20th century leisure to the shrine of its symbolic attenuation, a move that Kelly inherits a century later with much of its journey done. In his hands, the tokens of leisure are reworked as twisted shards and exhausted precipitants of formerly wholesome diversions now utterly forsaken, whether religious, sporting, musical, or domestic. If Kelly's shredded leisure plex is populated by a ragbag chorus of regional, everyday protagonists, a fun-loving citizenry quite at odds with the socially privileged subjects foregrounded by Veblen, 
Day is done, is uh, underwritten by at least one key proposition that is set in motion by the theory of the leisure class. This is the contention that the modal structure of modern leisure is founded on emulation and mimicry. For Veblen, the opportunities of leisure were converted into social capital by the acquisitive drive to emulate the actions, mores, and conducts of those deemed, according to the inexorable logic of class relations, to be one's, quote, betters. For Kelly, on the other hand, the protocols of emulation, while still crucial to the motivating principles of millennial leisure, have been spun in a centrifuge of stereotypical mimicries drawn from popular cultural codes and devices, dress up, music, dance, congregational behaviors of various kinds, etc. The stubborn continuity of emulational habit in the amphitheater of leisure allows us to grasp the downside of a signal antithesis set up by Day is Done between the widest predicates in the question of non-work activity. If we try to identify the cluster of effects ranged against the reduction of the mimetic impulse, they will be found, first of all, as a kind of off-stage obverse to the seemingly gratuitous play of imitations posited by Veblen and radically refocused and reorganized by Kelly. For it was on the grounds of a corrosive dispute with the ultimate consequences of cultural imitation that Bataille asserted his enduring belief in the prodigious effervescence of life associated with, quote, the sacred, and on the opposite grounds that Volta Benjamin defended them. Here are just a few carnival images some unusual ones, some commercial ones, some less commercial ones. These are in Rio and Haiti for the most part. Bataille considers the conditions of the carnival or festival as emblematic of the near impossibility of attaining to the, quote, contagious moments of a purely glorious consumption engendered by the transport of sacred experience. In one dimension, the festival acts as a staging point for rapture, quote, all the possibilities of consumption are brought together, says Bataille. Dance and poetry, music and the different arts contribute to making the festival the time and the place of a spectacular letting loose. But while it is thus a kind of crucible, quote, where distinctions melt in the intense heat of intimate life, the play and passion of festival functions are infiltrated by inexorable forces that bring about its reversion to the counter-sacral order of things in the name of a, quote, real community. Considered from Bataille's point of view, festival or carnival events are always tragic in that they offer a glimpse of ecstatic release usually eclipsed by the symbolic pressures of the community or social order. In his essay on the Marquis de Sade, Bataille offers his most succinct summary of the defining organization of human impulses in the polarity between excretion and appropriation, which follows on from the division of social facts into religious facts on the one hand and profane facts on the other. Excretion, he suggests, is associated with the heterogeneous expulsion of foreign bodies, with sexual activity, heedless expenditure, and certain, quote, fanciful uses of money. It is associated with religious ecstasy. 
Appropriation, on the other hand, finds its, quote, elementary form in oral consumption, and its process is thus characterized by a homogeneity, a static equilibrium of the author of the appropriation and of objects as a final result. Appropriational experiences may begin with the ordering of foreign bodies through digestive incorporation, but it extends to analogous forms of additive material, clothes, furniture, dwellings, and instruments of production, finally land divided into parcels. Such appropriations, notes Bataille, take place, quote, by means of a more or less conventional homogeneity or identity established between the possessor and the object possessed. Bataille, however, refuses to lock his oppositional constructs into binary separation. For, quote, production can be seen as the excretory phase of a process of appropriation, and the same is true of selling. While the practice of heterology, quote, leads to the complete reversal of the philosophical process, which ceases to be the instrument of appropriation and now serves excretion. It, <coughs> excuse me. it introduces the demand for violent gratification implied by social life. Now, if the borderline philosophy that Bataille calls heterology can be redeemed in voiding and violence, no such gratification and discomfort is associated with representation itself. For the desire to imitate, make, or copy is caught up in Bataille's formulation with the persistence of, quote, a dominant need for appropriation the sickly obstinacy of a will seeking to represent in spite of everything and through simple cowardice a homogenous and servile world. Air guitar, Frankfurt Stock Exchange Carnival, New York City in Las Vegas, and a bad image of a child, a father and a son in a gothic niche. This trenchant attack on the predicates of representation serves then as a caution. For the species of representation that the art world has for more than two decades called appropriation invests on its surface at least in an even more extreme antithesis, more cowardly, obstinate, sickly, and servile, to the heterog heterological discharge that is elevated by Bataille. Now, Walter Benjamin offers us a more temperate negotiation with Bataille's self-consciously extremist <coughs> excuse me, denigration of mimesis, which will help us to track some of the negotiations with these key concepts attempted by Kelly. In his short essay on the mimetic faculty, Benjamin sketches a matrix within which he conjugates um, imitation with play, cultic activity, dance, speech, hieroglyphs, and writing, some of the same core ingredients that make up day is done. For Benjamin, mimetic powers constitute a key foundational principle for the elaboration of cultic occasions dating back to the remote past. <coughs> what he terms the gift for producing similarities, for example, in dance, whose oldest function, quote, this is, also informs the very nature of play. Children's play, quote, is everywhere permeated by mimetic codes of behavior, though this play does not depend on just copying the actions and attire of working individuals, a shopkeeper, a teacher, etc., but may also embrace the imitation of objects or things. His examples are a windmill and a train. Benjamin's 
chief interest in, in um, chief interest um, is in the journey of the mimetic function from ritual to writing, from sensuous identification to non-sensuous symbolization, which he reformulates as a reprise of the history of reading, from the most ancient reading prior to all languages, from entrails, the stars or dances, through a new kind of reading of runes and hieroglyphs to the notational system uh, of written languages in which we can locate the most, quote, complete archive of what Benjamin terms non-sensuous similarity. Now, Kelly embarks on a similar journey through regimes of signification, sharing Benjamin's emphasis on the ritual enunciations of song and dance, a concern with the displaced mimeticism of play, and even his conception of the rune or hieroglyph as a semiotic way station between divination and writing. In number 14, Gothic Dance, quote, for you I shall interpret the rune upon my forehead. It is a secret, secret sign of my own design. But for Kelly, the semantics of imitation are set in an entropic counter-evolutionary sequence ordered only by the play of cliché dissipation and the historical delinquencies of its present-day social delivery. There are many ways to map the fraught but revealing relation between Kelly and Bataille grounded in their shared conception of the festival as a proving ground for synesthetic experience in sound, color, and movement. It seems clear first and foremost that within the mediated vernacular of Day is Done, the most obvious and certain absence is of any experience that might encompass sacred access, even though it trades in some of its diluted descendants, which include the animal sacrifice of the farm girl's song, the quote, searing voice of God in the potted plant's dialogue on Lady Bird Johnson's Arbor Day tree planting plan, also in number nine. Um, indeed, as Kelly underlined on the invitation card for the exhibition, which pictures him in the draining light of the evening, day is done transpires quite literally in extrasolar space. Simply put, the sun, Bataille's enduring symbol of sacral energy and burning consumption has set, and whatever follows is done in dimness. Kelly's project is, in fact, composed of choric chains of recurrent activity, symbolized, as you will have seen at the beginning, um, by uh, the opening scene of a chugga chugga train trio that shuffles around an endless circuit of institutional corridors, modeled on but by no means limited to the diurnal cycle of light and day. In his speech to the assembly of workers mustered outside the educational complex, the motivational vampire ringmasters the scenes that unfold by setting them in motion as a sequence of seasonal spectacles animated by the rites of spring. The guts of Kelly's extramural apparatus are formed in unequal dialogue between a ritual solar plexus comprised by intimations of lusty mythopoetic paganism, silent sunlight welcome in, there is work I must begin, and an economy of the ultra-mundane, within which spring fever, for example, is registered not as an emblem of organic regeneration, but in the form of, quote, facetious slogans posted on the staff bulletin board, draft beer, not plans. Support your local hobbit. <coughs> it is in the soliloquies and musings of the Woods group, a wandering ghoul, druid, and vampire couple, along with a wizard, 
which detaches itself from the motivational speech to roam through adjacent woodlands. And again, in the Song of the May Maynad, here, um, that Kelly conducts his most significant detour through the rhetorical intricacies of pagan nature worship and pantheist excess. And I'm going to skip over this little um, description of the druids and the vampires and the romantic excess. Here are some images from it. The spiraling diminuendo of carnival-like activity reaches into the spluttering half-light of the Kellyan presence under the impetus of several key cultural shifts, the most significant of which is the social degeneration of its forms through the era we might mark as postmodern. If one half-life for the carnival transpires between its medieval heyday and the mid-20th century moment when Bakhtin and Bataille offered their differently predicated commentaries on its forms and effects, then another has clearly elapsed in the half century since. What Kelly sets in motion then is emphatically a latter day is done, concocted in the shadows of symbolic restraints and political imperative. The advent of a self-conscious multiculturalism in the 1980s, coupled with more vigorous implementation of the division between church and state, have led, well, which is obviously being reversed uh, in the United States in the, in the current time, but was true at least a couple of years ago. All these, um, in a sense, have led to the reduction or near elimination of religious-based pageantry in recent times, even at parochial schools. The result is a more anodyne series of holiday programs that search out secular substitutes for the tokens of a religiosity now foreclosed. From the ashes of this prohibitionary scene rise febrile phoenixes such as Susan Beasley, 10, and Jessica Franks, 11, hamming it up during the, quote, mashed potatoes song at the Celebrate Autumn Holiday Program at Kotletch Elementary on Friday. At the same time, there is a kind of archaeological contemporaneity veined in Today is Done, quite at odds with the fast-track, high-tech, multimedia dispensation of sophisticated mass recreation, whether in interactive game consoles, the ultra mix and mega sound systems of hip clubs or post rave partying, or the state of the art animatronics and digital imaging at theme parks and civic events engineered in various liaisons with technologically entrepreneurial corporations. Of course, the elaborate stage managing of such events infuses them with a form of anterior reference programmed as spectacles, they have been arranged already. In this condition, they mirror a wider social shift from communal production to the false rhetoric of participation. Kelly has taken pains to point out that Days Done mobilizes the yearbook photographs as a repertoire of generic images rather than a generational imperative and that his main concerns are not specially organized around the experience or representation of childhood or adolescence, even though both age groups appear. We can, however, learn something significant about the aging of, of leisure into its contemporary formats by looking to another aspect of Benjamin's interest in the discourse of imitation, revealed by his comments on early play and childhood toys. For Benjamin, a key attribute of the transition from historical to modern forms of toy and pleasure production arise from their surrender to symbolic exchanges, quote, based on imitation. Always aware of the magic or cultic impress of ancient forms of dance and divination on the practices of the recent past, Benjamin makes several arguments in the cultural history of toys about the nature and conduct of play that are, I think, helpful here. 
First, he attacks the dour naturalism that underwrites traditional accounts of the realm of toys in order to correct the common but erroneous, quote, assumption that the imaginative contents of a children's, of a child's toys is what determines his playing, whereas in reality, the opposite is true. A child wants to pull something and so becomes a horse. He wants to play with sand and so he turns into a baker. He wants to hide and so he turns into a robber or a policeman, end quote. Benjamin argues here against the imposition of symbolism onto the toy or object of play, emphasizing the nature of the activity itself and ironically correlating it to profession or métier. This leads, secondly, to a comment on the formal abstractness of ancient playthings that were once presumably cultic objects, balls, hoops, tops, kites, quote, authentic playthings for Benjamin. The more authentic, quote, the less they meant to adults. Now, Benjamin is not, I think, asserting some ideal of the old order magical play of pure abstract form or, ab or action. And he tempers his conclusion that the more they, quote, um, they, appealing toys or genuine playthings, are based on imitation, the further they lead us from real living play, he tempers this, with the proviso that class, community, and nation are also inscribed into the formative experiences of childhood. But he underlines a key attribute of the social development of play in the shadows of which day is done seems inexorably immured. This is the overcoding and generic regulationism to which gestures of play have utterly succumbed in an era following on from the age of the movie star, the pop idol, and the fanzine, an era in which violence bites off its own tail in the echo chamber of virtual gaming, and blood and the color purple are nothing but special effects. Unlike Benjamin, however, Kelly places less of a premium on the transference of signification to the non-sensuous domain of language. This is due first to the regressive state of Kelly's lyrics themselves, posed as they are between cliché and lyric, ditty and rhyme, and secondly, because of his insistence on the compositional palpability of the sculptural elements in the exhibition, which are brought into being through the pleasures of making, material indulgence, even sensuous nonsense that Kelly makes a zigzag retreat from the sacred under the gravitational pull of our times is abundantly clear. But on another level, he appears to take up with several strategies that resist, in part at least, the withering away of Carnival's relations to para-human experience. Triangulated by the remnants of a stilted sublime, purple mountains, deep, deep caves, mystical tautologies and entomological reveries, um, such as those of the wizard, uh, which conjure up an omnivorous environment of color and sound. The pseudo-pastoral re rehearsed by the Woods Group is another of Kelly's paradises done, if you like, ass backwards. Here, pantheistic transcendence is simultaneously parried and parodied but at the same time passed on and incorporated as a key motif of Kelly's phantom folklore. Consider too the recurrent vampire figures, the Sweeney Todd undertones of the barbershop scene, and even the regimen of reds and purples deployed in the piece for various appositional effects to proper, to proffer, sorry, subtle intimations of the bloodletting and sacrifice elevated by Bataille as the surest tokens of the sacred. The shy Satanist here on screen vents a mantra of florid purple lyrics, while the chant of the May Maynad is ironically laced with mayhem, blood, and gore. While Kelly's day may be 
done, all the ensuing actions refuse to play themselves out behind a stage set drip dipped in darkness. Kelly casts off the shackles of the art world's millennial chiaroscuro, replacing it with a rainbow assemblage of mutated and self-referring structures and objects. Backdrops, props, architectural details, doors, windows, facades and walls mix with altars, pillars, podia and signage to emerge as off-set post-production sculptures that frame and bracket the suite of video projections. The logic that governs their appearance and positions is of the same order as the extrapolative reading of the photographs, ranging from attempts to simulate or replicate to flourishes of projective association, the latter emblematized in the stuffed sculptures composed from costumes and leftovers whose forms emerged as the now unpersoned materials, quote, fell into place in folded combinations and stitched aggregates. All this transpires under the sign, if not the cover, of darkness as the artist unleashes a spectrum of energetic and saturated colors a pulsing theatre sign, flashing Christmas lights at the nativity, the purple of the uh, shy Satanist suburban layer, and so on. Even the Pepto-Bismol and color, uh, candy-coloured rock video behind Mary's throne. <coughs> Just as the cloth sculptures connect with Kelly's signature series of animals and Afghans that commenced in the late 1980s. So this prismatic sequencing with its goofy symbologies and rainbow coalition of homespun illusions reactivates Kelly's long-standing interest in modernist color theory, especially the Hans Hoffman variant that informed his art school education. At heart then, to conclude, Day is Done is a cross between low-end community theater, free-fall pantomime, and the off-Broadway musical. It trades in dozens of sonic forms, from church organ to hardcore rap, from techno to tambourines. Working with composer and sound engineer Scott Benzel and choreographer Kate Foley, and in the context of his career-long commitment to noise and improv, dating back to the early days of Destroy All Monsters, in the 1970s, Kelly has assembled something of a Watts Tower of soppy ballads and church hall choruses, barbershop arias and minimalist compositions. He uses the ricochet of these musical formats to speed up the deformation of the rituals around which they sound out. Ritual activities generally commence with a core set of actions and objects focused on a social or religious center at a text or remembered script. Through centuries of transmission within the purview of the church or folk memory or other institutions that preserve them, ritual forms inexorably modify as a consequence of changing social contexts, reformulations of dogma, economic circumstances, and so on. In the process, some version of the core event is usually preserved, though in some cases they, involve, they evolve almost completely into another shape. Christmas is a perfect example, a pagan ritual annexed by Christianity for its own anniversary needs and then progressively secularized until it becomes today's mall and market-oriented circus. Kelly puts all this on the skids, accelerating its tectonic social shifts concentrating centuries of modification into the space between a photograph and a performance, and then looping that back and around the original event by crossing it with an encyclopedic commonplace book of other genres and illusions. Another way to figure Kelly's elaborate rethinking of appropriation and the new take on truth and originality it ushers in is to consider this exhibition as the last link in a chain of preemptive restagings. A beginning for all this arrives before the yearbook photos whose opaque preservation of strange vernacular ritualized forms so compelled the artist. Somewhere behind each of them was an original performance or event, even if it was nothing more than a bunch of high school kids 
standing around waiting to get photographed and then being caught in position. Someone was posing, gesturing, acting at some place and point in time and those postures were brought to a standstill in a representation. Kelly returns to the event through the image in order to use it as a point of departure. But as we've seen, the process doesn't stop there, it only begins. The artist builds up a defiantly elaborate set of his own restagings. He makes sets, he casts actors, he interpolates dialogue, scores music in a myriad styles, recreates and invents costumes, choreographs movement and dance, mixes inside and outdoor, goth and hick, thug and choir girl. And then, Everything done so far is restaged once more in sculptures built from the recycled materials that feature in the enactments. This is a massive investment in a whole cascade of restaging possibilities, augmented and interrupted by what the artist has termed structures of material non-meaning, clearly quite removed from the more managed unitary forms of 1980s or postmodern appropriation. Kelly has intervened in a sequence of events beginning with something we could describe as mythologically original. The photo stands as the midpoint, if you like, of an hourglass-shaped funnel, the top of which is entirely the domain of the artist's own devising. Unraveling a serpentine spiral of song and dance, cunningly filtered through myth and memory, fact and fantasy, Kelly has ordained here a mesmeric event structure that knits art and popular masquerade into a tragic, comic, technicolor dream coat. Thank you. Well, this work, I guess, would be, would be relatively unfamiliar because it was only seen in a show in New York last year. But uh, maybe some of his earlier work might, might be familiar. But, you know, in a, in a funny sense, Mike Kelly's work, uh, it's terrifically popular in Europe and uh, in L.A. and to a certain extent in New York. But he's not been a major presence in England for some reason. I don't quite know why. He hasn't had a major exhibition here, hasn't had a retrospective here. No, I think that's a complex issue. I mean, it's partly because of the sense somehow the art space in the early 90s was taken up by young British art. Absolutely. In, yep. in some way. Yep. Uh, Working with their own vernacular, which was so right. different. And that yeah. sort of really split for a short while, at least, kind of the UK off from, I think. Yep. Uh, you know, we expected it to have roughly the same art syllabus. Hmm. I don't know whether you know that sort of five-year series on contemporary artists, but it's a very good place to start. I mean, he edited it and has a kind of introduction. Uh, it does actually reprint one of the Bataille essays, yep. doesn't it? Yep. Style. And Vidler's essays. And also, yep. you know, from an architectural point of view, you can come at it through Tony Vidler's mm -hmm. Which is about that that project called Educational Complex. That's right. So, which you saw, which which is actually the point of origin for all of this, uh, in in that kind of bizarre retreating and fantastic way that Kelly conjures. Okay. Well, I'd just like to thank you very much for what I thought was a tremendous Good. presentation. I'm extremely sorry for the poverty of our turnout. <laughs> Not for you, though. Uh, <laughs> sorry, I saw the comment. I could be grotesque. Uh, 
But I do hope that, that, that you'll come and speak again and I'll ensure you uh, a better audience. But thank you very much. Okay, pleasure. Thanks.